the neocons want more war. Well, that in and of itself is not surprising, but it is interesting to see how warmongers try to spin their hellish visions for death and destruction. So just yesterday, two of the most powerful people in US politics, two Democratic senators, published an article in the neocon outlet Foreign Policy, which I would like to study together with you to understand the psychology of these people. The article is entitled, A Path Toward Peace Requires More US Engagement, Not Less. Uh, two senators on why the United States remains an essential partner in both Ukraine and the Middle East. Um, and it's written by these two people, Richard Blumenthal and Chris Kuhn. So that's uh, him here, uh, Richard Blumenthal. He belongs to the geriatric class of US politics. He was born in 1946. He's 78 years old by now and, um, and still um, very much responsible for sending young Americans abroad uh, to die in, in foreign wars. And this is, of course, the entire article is a defense of this, of this strategy. The other one is Chris Kuhn's. Um, both of them are Democrats. Um, you know, being a Democrat does not mean at all that you're that you're pro peace. It just means that you're for one one version of um, of foreign wars. Uh, I care about this quite a lot because, you know, senators are very powerful people um, by virtue of not being many. The U.S. Congress is made of this of two ha of two chambers, right? The the Senate is the upper house and it only has 100 members. Um, so each senator um, carries quite a lot of weight. In the House of Representatives, you have 435 people. So, you know, um, uh, personal opinions are a little bit more diluted. The, 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 the senators just have have, uh, quali have more to say for for the simple reason that they're that they're less because both chambers have about the same um, same amount of power when it comes to passing bills and making le legislation. So um, let's let's dive into this and see how these people try to to justify uh, foreign wars. Just why is it okay to constantly for the United States to uh, to be militarily engaged? Because whenever these people say engagement abroad, what they are think thinking about is not trade. It's not uh, foreign aid. It is it is not uh, peaceful engagement. It is military engagement. Whenever these people talk about about leading the world, what they mean is military leading. Um, so let's see how they spin this. The article starts with, last month we visited elected and military leaders in the Middle East and Ukraine, two seemingly unrelated regions linked by a similar threat, a malign and destructive force that gravely endangers national security as well as regional stability. Quite interesting, isn't it, um, how you justify for an engagement with the with the presence of malign, with evil being abroad. This is, this is where, you know, this entire um, neocon thinking of the world becomes almost messianic, right? Because uh, what you're doing is you, the good guys, you defend uh, the good people at home, you protect them at home by making wars uh, abroad because if the uh, these malign influences manage to spread then uh, it, it's well it's the middle east and ukraine today but it is chicago and new york tomorrow the domino theory they will they will get us all that has been you know vietnam war and so on it has always been the the refrain that we need to fight abroad in order to pro to to protect ourselves at home therefore um under neocon thinking um this actually all counts as defense which yeah well i mean it's called the um, the Defense Department, even though this is uh, like foreign foreign military bases and so on, so on are very much forward offensive uh, structures that are that are used to project power. But the the idea of the neocons is always let's uh, excuse it by by defense, right? And here here the same. So evil is abroad, we will fight evil. The article continues. In both regions, U.S. commitment and engagement are indispensable to preserving democracies and ending lethal armed conflict. In both, failing to do so will have decades-long destructive consequences, not just for Washington, Washington standing around the globe, but also for US interests and even American lives in these regions. And this is something that I find really interesting. So in order to protect lives, the point is not to make sure that there are no Americans in harm's way abroad. Uh, no, you do the opposite. You put American military personnel into Iraq, into Syria, into places where uh, a lot of forces don't want them. And when something happens to, the, to these forces, you then claim that American lives have been attacked and lost and therefore you need to fire back. That's exactly what happened when these three uh, uh, US um, military personnel, all of them 
all of them uh, actually actually uh, Af African um, Americans you know um because the, the of course the the, the the any kind of military will always be staffed with young people and and often with um, people from poorer backgrounds uh, because that's 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 what you do right rich kids don't fight wars it's always the kids of the poor that are fought to uh, that are sent to fight wars and die uh, for 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 empire it has always been like that um and you know i keep wondering how it is that switzerland is so much better at protecting its uh, its people that no swiss people die in syria no swiss military dies in iraq or in uh, in the middle east or you know how is it that that the swiss are so much more capable of protecting their people than the united states well it, of course it's by not sending them abroad uh, by not having them engage in uh, in military conf uh, conflicts outside outside of the country that's that's how the swiss do it but apparently the um, the American strategy is the is the opposite, and then when you create a tripwire, and then somebody trips on the tripwire, then you uh, you cry foul and you say like, oh, um, we've been we've been attacked while our people are occupying Syria. But that's what it is, and the spin is of course that it's all done in the name of defense. The con the article then continues talking about uh, linking uh, linking Gaza and Ukraine. Innocent civilians in Gaza have no place left to run, no food to eat. Ukrainian troops are rationing ammunition on the front lines and losing territory to the Russians. Also note how the war in Ukraine here is is immediately is immediately presented as something that's in that was created by Russia, whereas the suffering of civilians in Gaza is something that more that happens. We don't know exactly who it is. It's like the passive. Uh, passive voice right uh, gas uh, civilians are suffering not that they're being attacked not that they're, they're being killed by u.s made bombs but you by u.s made artillery uh shells no they're just you know they have nowhere to run i mean poor them it's like a natural disaster that befalls people in gaza whereas with you with uh, you Ukraine. The article is very good at immediately pointing out that it's the Russians who are responsible for well, for what's happening to to suffering in Ukraine. Right? This is how you spin this stuff. Um, Ukrainian troops are dying and losing ground because they lack the basic equipment they need to continue their fight is what the article says, and it also continues, it is with US military support, however, that Ukraine cannot only fight back, but can win. Without it, Ukraine is much more likely to fail, and sooner than many may think. Once Ukraine falls, Russian President Vladimir Putin's next attack will likely be against a NATO ally, compelling us to come to their defense and inevitably putting our own troops in the front lines. So neocons um, are still very much happy about uh, about the fact that the proxy war in Ukraine is still only fought with U with Ukrainian uh, forces, and it's only Ukrainians who have to die. I mean, this has been said over and over again, and we know that uh, the idea of NATO is still to fight to the last Ukrainian. Um, but the the rationale now for sending even more weapons is is still the same as two years as two years ago. It's like uh, if we don't stop it in Ukraine, then the domino is going to happen, just like with the Vietnam War, right? And Vietnam, of course, South Vietnam fell. South Vietnam was Iraq eradicated and today the United States has a security uh, uh, a partnership with North Vietnam uh, it upgraded its relationship with North, with North Vietnam just last year and is that was very very proud of the fact that now um, Vietnam is 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 a part is a, a close military um partner of of the US this is quite crazy to me because that's the people who 50 years ago they were fighting to the death and it was exactly the same the same rhetoric back then and it's as it is today which just shows that there's nothing behind this 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 fear mongering and scaremongering that oh there's no possible scenario under which we could ever be friends with the russians again you are friends after 45 50 years with the north vietnamese again the current government of vietnam is north vietnam right it's the ones that you lost against and the um the 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 us is today very happy uh, using or trying to work with vietnam against china right because you have another enemy there's there's always an enemy and there's uh, these these kind of animosities or the fact that that Vietnam is a communist authoritative government doesn't doesn't matter at all to the United States to the same people it doesn't matter at all that this is an authoritarian government in Vietnam as long as you can um, strike a deal with them in order to somehow um, uh, potentially fight China in the future although I must say Vietnam is Vietnam is very smart in what it does currently with the US and the US is uh, horribly over interpreted Interpreting um, its uh, relationship with Vietnam, but okay, let's go back to the article now. 
Article says, our troops may be equally at risk in the situation in Ga if the situation in Gaza worsens and conflict spreads through the region. Iranian proxies such as the Yemen-based Houthis, Lebanon-based Hezbollah and the Islamic uh, resistance in Iraq are seeking to capitalize on the gro growing anti-Americanism and achieve Iran's long-desired goal of forcing the withdrawal of US troops from the region. The article tries to connect the withdrawal of US troops with the goals of Iran, which means that, um, you know, if the troops left, um, if, a set, if a different vision of US engagement in world politics became reality, then that would mean victory for Iran. So in order for Iran not to win, the US needs to remain. So that's the... That's the warmonger mindset. Um, any kind of lose on our, our side, any kind of um, withdrawal on our side is automatic a vict automatically a victory for the other one. It's also like very, very neocon to have this um, zero-sum mentality. There is no win-win situation. There's no prospering together. There's only either we w either we win, the other one loses, or, or nothing. So stand your ground, blah, 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 blah. Um, very, very, very paradigmatic. <clears throat> the article continues. We cannot afford to let Iran succeed. Otherwise, the United States will face very real prospect of war. Um, this engagement leaves countries in the region with even fewer options and no choice but to embrace malign influences such as Iran. We cannot hope to change minds or build relationship if we back away. And again, um, notice how it is utterly unthinkable for these people that Iran could be anything else but a malign influence. That it is pos that it might be possible that that you could work with Iran. That Iran might have positive influences in the in the region. Um, that is unthinkable. Iran is pure evil, and you need to fight evil. Therefore, you need to stay. That's a very the stupid, but 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 very straightforward way these people think. The article continues, ultimately, preventing a wider war in the Middle East will require delivering a message demonstrating that Washington recognizes Israel's obligation to defeat, uh, to defend itself, but also expects that Israel upholds international humanitarian and human rights law and that its military operations meet the highest standards. So at this point, I actually was a little bit surprised by the article because it does for the first time um, criticize Israel a little bit, a tiny little bit. It's, it's, it's of course utterly ludicrous after four months, five months of slaughtering Palestinians to still say that, you know, this is what Israel should do. Israel should live up to the highest standards. I mean, it's literally... The, it's literally the opposite. Like Israel has been has been has been uh, treating humanitarian law and human rights law with like non-existent. The opposite. Uh, like everything that these two bodies of law say, it Israel has been doing the opposite. And this article then still somehow these people have the goal to say like, oh, we have to hold them to the highest standards, right? So if what Israel is doing are the highest standards, then good night. Like everybody, we just we just should walk away because this is there's. Uh, this genocide is, of course, uh, utterly horrible. And it's so horrible, it's so horrible that even neocons can n have a hard time sugarcoating it. This is the best that they can do in sugarcoating it. And you will see it's not, I mean, um, uh, even for neocons, this is, this is tough at this point. The article continues. For example, the National Security Memorandum that US President Joe Biden released last month, which requires allies receiving military aid to provide assurances to the United States that their actions are compliant with international law, was able to send a strong message to Israel and the, regions as a the region as a whole. Really? Really? I mean, they are pretending that, that US foreign policy is doing something, that Joe Biden is doing something, but the message is obviously not heard. I mean, the, the dying continues and the large-scale atrocities are all continuing as we speak. So I don't know what these what, what these people are thinking about. I mean, it's obviously propaganda. It's obviously meant this is this is, this is is window dressing, right? You, you put on strong language, but actually nothing happens. I mean, as long as the United States sends bombs and weapons and everything and, and billions and billions of money uh, in order for Israel to do whatever it wants to the Palestinians, as long as that, that happens, Israel will not feel anything. I mean, these these words don't mean anything unless political action follows, and political action doesn't follow. This is all still window dressing. Um, the article continues. To show that it is serious about protecting civilians and aid workers in Gaza, Israel should open additional borders crossing and improve deconflicting mechanisms to increase humanitarian assistance. Um, regardless, the United States isn't waiting to deliver aid. 
So yes, this is all the things that Israel should do and Israel should stop killing civilians and the United States should stop providing the weapons in order to kill the civilians and uh, while pretending that, you know, there's nothing the US can do. The US has no power over Israel. They, they pre stop pretending that. But this is this is the best spin they can get on this, right? Um, and then, of course, saying that the, the US will now do amazing uh, humanitarian work, which the, Israel will immediately blow up. I mean, basically what you're doing now at this point is saying like, we will provide food for people People who will then later be killed with full bellies by the by the Israelis. Um, that's as sad as the, this moment is. Um, the article goes, in our meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, yeah, we, warned, we warned against a large scale ground offensive in the city of Rafah. The United States is the only nation that has the credibility to send this message to Israel. If Netanyahu fails to listen, the Biden administration and Congress will be prepared to take more persuasive steps to ensure compliance with US policy. It has been five months, guys. Guys, it has been five months. And Israel is obviously slaughtering Palestinians by the tens of thousands and is not it's not stopping the worst and you're not doing anything there's no there's nothing not even not not even not just withholding no pressure like not even withholding weapons right this is still us weapons killing these people um we have real hope, says the article, that a meaningful humanitarian pause in the fighting in Gaza combined with hostage release is within reach. Now, this is also quite outrageous because the article doesn't call for a ceasefire, just a humanitarian pause, right? This is the best they can they can muster. They're not co even calling for a ceasefire. That's how you know that these people are still very much beholden to the uh, to the in entire agenda of uh, of actually the Israeli government, right? Because a humanitarian pause is something very different. A humanitarian pause, if, Ga if Hamas decides to sign a, a agreement that there will be a two two week humanitarian pause and then release all the hostages by by the agreement the Israelis after two weeks will have the right to go and continue and do the bombing um, and and continue killing as many police as uh, Palestinians what you need is a ceasefire and you need the agreement of the Israelis to stop killing pal uh, Palestinians um, even if that means not killing more Hamas people because for some reason in the West it seems to be acceptable to say that all of Hamas needs to die and Hamas needs to agree to being rooted out and to be to be killed that's that that's the minimum standard that apparently the west is setting the um and that in the process of that even slaughtering all the palestinians is is okay that's the uh that's still the the, the mindset um so the article doesn't call for a ceasefire but just for humanitarian pause a long humanitarian pause could even uh, reopen the door to a greater possibility for peace in the middle east through israel saudi normalization and economic integra integration so the article doesn't actually want a permanent ceasefire it what it what it what it wants and what the neocons want is um is this goal they want they they are really really pissed at the fact that um, the October 7 attack derailed these efforts to um, normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which would be a huge deal, would be a very big deal. And they want to get back to this. And their vision of peace for the Middle East is one in which uh, in which US influence and Israeli influence reigns supreme, right? Um, over all others, because what neocons can stand above all is somebody who says we don't want that. We will take. We will do something else. They they do not. They want absolute dominance and control. And their the vision for peace does not necessarily include the Palestinians. What it includes is control um, of the United States through through all of its proxies in the Middle East. Understanding that Hamas and its backers in Iran carried out its atrocious attack on October 7, partially to prevent realignment between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Um, this is what's, what's important to them. And again, the link Hamas is Israel. Israel uh, is, is a terrorist state and they're pure evil, right? So there's, again, linkage between all the, th all the bad things that are happening and Iran, of course. We were close to an agreement prior to October 7 attacks. A pause in fighting could get us to, co uh, to conditions where constructive dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Israel can happen. Not between Israel and Palestine, not between Israel and Hamas. <laughs> the neocons care about Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Israel. The article continues, at every stop on our trip, we heard that the solution to building greater security and a, and a potential path toward peace is more US engagement, not less. Yeah, because you only talk to people who, you are, who, who actually agree with you and invited you in the first place, right? I mean, if you talk to Netanyahu and the Israelis, it's no wonder that you hear that. Um, this means ut utterly nothing.
Um, the article continues, we can set the Israel-Hamas war on a path to peace by making it clear to the Israelis what we expect from them in the region and taking steps to ensure a real Palesti Palestinian future. Thank you. At least that, at least once you mentioned it at the end, um, at least that. We can give Ukraine the support it needs to defeat the brutal Russian invasion. So again, more war, more war. We need to solve our problems through war. We need we need war. That's what they're, or what they're yelling for. That might seem like a tall order, but none of it comes together without the United States leading the way. And again, leading the way militarily, no diplomacy, no peaceful approaches, no attempts at de-escalation, just always more of the same and more military, more military spending. And leadership always means military leadership. Um, I hope to see the day when the United States will redefine leadership as being a constructive citizen of the of the international community and foster peace to break out instead of war until there it might still be a long way and i apologize my apologies to all my american friends i don't mean to criticize uh you, I don't mean to. I don't mean to be mean to uh, to Americans. Um, I think this is an outgrowth of um, of great power, of great power delusion. Um, uh, I would just hope that we can raid in the these powers, these people who create who create the conditions for large scale death and destruction through this kind of narrative and psychology of domination. Thank you. Thank you.